kind of coming back. Yes, it does come. And put on it, it is good for a while. Then, the moment of the Messiah. Several meanings are brought for the meaning of the word Mauna. Amongst them is our God. Then there's Amalek. Then it is the one who has taken charge, who has given charge of the affairs of someone. And Mona also comes in the meaning of the beloved, comes in the meaning of companion side. Hadith and Nazir the guest. Hajjab, Shari, partner, son, Sir, the son in law. And it comes in the meaning of the family members, the relatives, male relatives like the uncle and so on, and the cousins, of course, the male relatives. Al Munim, Al Munam Ali, the one who gives. Blessing, the one who received the blessing. Al-Mu'atib. Al-Mu'atib. The one who frees a slave. That slave, that slave who is free. All of these come in the meaning of Mona. So it is not restricted. It is not just one meaning. So the one, the meaning when we refer to the ulama is the meaning of a slave. One who has God's word who is leading us. This has, I mean, the uh, North African world, the European people, they refer to their own as Sidi. Sidi. Meaning Sayidi. Our leader, a leader. So, in the same way, Monana is the same kind of concept. It means our leader. It's not that we're taking that this person is God, and it's not that we're taking him as a freed slave. Although sometimes that's how we deal with the like us, but that's another discussion for another day. So, next question. I've been seeing many people claim online that Ash'ari and Maturiti schools of Aqidah are outside of Ahlul Sunnah. This is true. How can one determine if the school of Aqidah is within Ahlul Sunnah? So, this is this one is a very, very lengthy discussion. And those people who Look, when we look at these different schools of Aqidah, generally, it's not something that we bust our heads with. For the regular person, he will not even get into this. What will we learn? We'll learn, Amantu Billahi Kama Huwa. I believe in Allah as He is. Because I cannot properly describe as He is. Bi asma'ihi wa sifatihi. With His names and His attributes. I believe in Him, in him as He is. There's many things that I don't know. But as he is with his nature and his attributes, وَقَبِلْ تُ جَمِيعَ أَحْكَامِهِ And I have accepted all of his commandments, his prohibitions, everything I've accepted. So this is the fundamental thing that each and every one of us must believe in. Now in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself in many ways. In, he mentions, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing like him. There is nothing like him. You know, one question I ask the people who, you know, they come to me with this question, I say, what is a circle in 2D? Now a person is able to ex explain to me what a circle in 2D is, straightforward. What is a circle in 3D? X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared equals 1, right? It becomes a sphere, straightforward. Or maybe not. If we're rotating on itself, it becomes a sphere. If we're raising it and lowering it, then it becomes a cylinder. If we are rotating it on an axis, then it becomes a donut. You're following me. So what was the sphere, what is the circle gone into 3D? Now there's a lot of discussion. Okay, no problem. What's the circle in 4D? Even I have no clue. I cannot describe it. You know, simplistically, I would say x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals, and plus a squared equals to 1. Well, what does that represent physically? I have no idea. I've just extended the formula with another variable, but I have no idea what it means. A circle is something that I was powerless to explain its reality. Just a circle in 4D, powerless. 
And I hope to explain what Allah is when Allah has told us Laysa Kabithli Shay. So my respect to brothers and elders, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions several things in the Quran about himself. He mentions that he has a saq. He has a saq, which is a shin. He mentions Yadullah Fawqaidi. His hand is. The hand of Allah is over their hands. So these are things that now how these words have been uh, they have interpreted this this is where the difference in these schools of thought of aqidah come in. Some have said that you know he has a hand. Now what is haqiqat means that what the mind would naturally go to. That what the mind will immediately go towards. So when I say a hand, what do I think about? Four fingers and a thumb. But does Allah have four fingers and a thumb? When He says there's nothing like Him? No. So, those people who have, you know, they said that we believe that Allah has a yad, but we're not going to describe it. So that's one school. There's another school that says that they make the weed. They say, Allah knows what He, you know, we believe as it is, we're not even going to get into it. Haqiqatan, whatever, we're not even going to get into it, we make the wheel. And then there's another school that says, you know what, when we start talking about yet, then people will immediately start imagining things. Something will come to their mind. Something will come to their mind. So in order to prevent this, we will make that wheel, we will interpret it. So we'll say that, Yadullahi ma'al jama'ah. The hand of Allah is with the jama'ah. We will say, you know, it means that the assistance and the help of Allah is with the jama'ah. So then we save people from a bigger problematic thing, which is to make that seem, to give a shape and a form to Allah. So look, these are things that the Ash'ari and Maqlini, these schools, they are within Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. There is no doubt that they are within Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah. They choose to make taqweed or taqweed depending on it was whether it was the recent or you know the mutaqaddimin or the mutaakhirin. They had slightly different ways of doing things. Mutaqaddimin, they would generally be towards taqweed. They would generally say, we're not going to get into it. We believe, as Allah has said, we're not going to get into it. The more contemporary ulama, they made that wheel so that the people's minds would be saved from putting a picture and putting a shape to Allah. So, this, none of them, and this Maturidi, Ash'ari are not out of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'at. They are Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'at. And those accusations which are made against them, then they make ta'atil. They say, oh, but you know, Allah does Allah has a yet but we're not going to describe it. No, they're not making ta'atil. They're not making Allah useless, so to speak. Ta'atil means to make something useless. That we don't accept anything. No, we accept everything. But we just don't try to explain it. Because we've understood we couldn't explain a circle in 4D. So Allah is who are we to restrict Allah to 3D or 4D or 5D? He is as his Amantu Billahi. We have accepted that. So there's further discussions both ways, but simplest, you know, simple answer that whatever the Ahlu Sunnah, whatever the Maturiya Shari will do, it is within Ahlu Sunnah. What is the best way that I can learn the names of Allah and His attributes and live by them? What you can do is you can go and bother Mulana Akbar. He's, <laughs> he's uh, very skilled in this. And mashallah, you know, we encourage him that, you know, Akbar, you know, we need someone to give us a dars of the yasma and sifat of Allah. And actually, right now, as you know, things are going on in our intensive class, he is covering aqidah. So, for those who are interested, join up. And, how we're going to live by them, the more we give da'wah towards them, the more we talk about them, this is the more it affects us.
person he knows that Allah is Razak. A person he knows it with his mind. But how will this reality come into his life? How will he live by it? The more he talks about it. The world keeps telling him, if you don't do this, you're not going to survive. If you don't do this, you're not going to get by. What does he do? He has to keep reminding himself, no, it's not my job that gives a risk. It is Allah who gives a risk. It is not the shop that gives a risk. It is Allah who gives a risk. When all the asbab of risk are going to be tied up, Allah is still going to be the one who gives a risk. Next question. How do you explain to a non-believer why there is evil? So this is a common uh, stunt that atheists and people who are trying to disprove the existence of a God, they're going to try to say that if your God is so merciful and He knows everything, then how is, why is there evil on the face of the earth? And why they say, when they talk about evil, they mean any type of bad thing, any type of inconvenience. Someone tripped on a, you know, tripped on a branch. They say, why does, why does, why is this there? So on the one hand, they want to establish, they want to put you in one of two traps. Either they're going to say that you, um, you know, God has to, He abides by the natural law, or are you going to obey your law, are you going to be, obey your God when He tells you to do something you know, completely uncalled for? And both of these are bothered. Both of these are bad. And we come back to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself has said. What does He say? He says, Allah the one who created death and life so that He may test you to say who will do the best of deeds. So one thing, Allah is telling us, why did He put us in this world? So that He tests us. This world, this life is a trial. It is a trial. It is not a means of comfort. It is no one's jannah. This, this life is a trial. And like Rasulullah mentions in hadith to the meaning, you know, which ends with that even to the extent of a thorn trick, a thorn prick, which pricks uh, a believer, this becomes a means of forgiving his sins. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created this world. He created this world, He created the laws within this world. So He is the one who established what is good, what is not good. They are trying to establish that you know, there was already a natural law before God just popped into the picture. Actually what you must understand is that Allah created this world. And He created this natural law. That people generally understood murdering is bad. They understood murdering is bad, but there comes some times when it is permissible to take the life of someone. And Allah has clarified when those times are. And it is generally bad to hurt someone, but there are certain times when it becomes permissible. And those have been laid out for us. So, that's one thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established that order of what of the natural order which is in the world. And they, you see in this question, they present that God is merciful and He knows everything. He knows everything, He sees everything. But they lose track of the fact that He is Al-Hakim. He is the most wise. His plan is complete. So the more a person is wise, the more a being is wise, the more you, you know, you might not necessarily grasp what he's saying. A person says that, I'm going to take your child, and I will slice his abdomen open, and I will remove a portion of his intestinal, you know, his, his digestive system. And then the people start freaking out, oh my God, you're a barbarian, you're a butcher. So actually, I'm the GI doctor from Lakeshore Hospital. You know, your your child has you know has a problem. You know his appendix is about to burst. So you know we need to remove that so to keep him healthy. Now all of a sudden this thing which seems so barbaric, now we understand that oh actually it is such a good thing that this person is doing. 
So the more a person is wise, the more you know, he can he might say something which you might not grasp, but which is which is inherently good. But we have to admit our ignorance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al Hakim. When he tells us to do something, it is necessarily good. Even if he tells us to do something which is generally not you know, accepted or not considered as good. Now what we have to understand is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he ordered Ibrahim alayhi salam to sacrifice Ismail alayhi salam. So if God tells you to sacrifice your son, are you going to do it? Well, Allah commanded Ibrahim alayhi salam to do it. Allah is not telling us to do it. Our sharia is established. Our sharia is not going to change till the end of time. Our sharia is not going to change. So Allah established what was the general law of good. Allah ordered us to do that good. Exceptionally, Allah will order His prophets. Allah will put them through tests. And whatever Allah orders them to do through tests, it might be something which a person generally understands, or it might be different from what a person generally understands. But since we understand, we believe that as Allah is Al-Hakim, and He is Al-Adl, and He is Rahim, He is Rahman, what Allah tells us to do here, is good here. And if so, there's suffering in the world, because it is like that doctor who is going to put that child to the knife. Yes, there will be an immediate difficulty, an immediate hardship, but there will be ease down the line. So the believer understands that there might be difficulty in this world, but there will be ultimate ease and comfort and goodness in the Akhir. So now, question is that sometimes I feel like a big hypocrite due to the hellfire. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once had sahabah along, they mentioned that we have such thoughts which cross our minds, that we do not even feel, you know, we cannot even utter them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them that this is, this is the truth, that this is the reality of your iman. This is a pure iman. That a person, he feels bad over his sins. This is good. If a person felt nothing over his sins, then it would be problematic. But a person feels sad over his sins, this is a good thing. Now in addition to that, do not be hopeless of the mercy of Allah. Because Allah forgives all sins. A person comes back to Allah repentant. He comes back to Allah sincerely hoping for forgiveness. Doing his best to leave these sins, inshallah Allah will forgive him. And at the same time, do not become careless in falling into sins. Because a person who does that, and then shaitan you know, has tricked him in the other way. Iman is the balance between the two. Between hope in the mercy of Allah and fear in one sense. Next section is about, some, about doubts. Some doubts that came along the way. So... Questioner asks, is it permissible to have a dog if we restrain it outside our personal space and our prayer area? He mentions, I heard the house in which there is a dog, angels will not come in. Let's say we keep it in our main floor and outside, and we sleep and pray upstairs. So will this hadith be an effect for this situation? Look, Rasulullah sallallahu mentions that that house in which there is a dog or a pig, the angels do not come. And when we look at what does it mean for the la'an, the curse of Allah, to be upon someone, they explain it as someone being, you know, the mercy of Allah being distanced from someone. So if a person is being distanced from the mercy of Allah, he's being distanced from the angels, then it's problematic. So, you know, the the schools of thought, the majority of the schools of thought consider the saliva of the dog to be najis. The Malikiya considered Amr Ta'abudi, that a person washes after the saliva of the dog comes, but it's not inherently because it's najis. But the majority do consider it najis. So a person he is having najas in his home, he is being distanced from the pain, from the mercy of Allah, distanced from the angels entering his home. This is problematic. So this is something that we should avoid. If a person has a hunting dog or a security dog, that's another story. 
but just a dog that he keeps as a pet, you should avoid that. Questioner asks, I've currently decided to stop my addiction, but I often re relapse. What would you suggest? I suggest keep going at it, keep trying. If it's reached a point that you, know, you are in need of professional help, get professional help if you need. Do what you gotta do, but do not, do not uh, become despondent of the mercy of Allah. Keep trying, keep doing your best, keep making sincere intention to leave your mistakes, your faults. Inshallah, Allah will give you, Allah will support you, Allah will give you help, Allah will reward you through this process. Is it halal to drive too fast on the highway? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Look, I'm, not, I'm never going to encourage anyone to drive too fast. And arguably what's more problematic is when people drive stupid. So do not drive stupid. Now in terms of how fast you drive, I hear that there's a margin of error in the, in the, in the devices and instruments used to check the speed. So if you're going to be between 100 and 120 on the highway, then it's still going to be considered, you know, you do a little pass. It's not who I am. So I'm not going to discuss any further than that. So how about to get depressed in studies? And what should I do if I'm academically stupid? Okay. Look. What would I I'd advise someone that yeah, what should you do? Do not get depressed. Study something that interests you. And study with teachers who are inspiring. There's some subjects that are very dry. And there's some subjects that they're dry, but their teachers make it very captivating. I had such a class. I did organic chemistry too. I did in McGill. So I happened to study with Joe Schwartz. And he was a very interesting teacher. He would you know go on the board and he would draw things. He would draw you know big molecules like this is LSD. Like alright you got my you got my attention. Now this is how you make it. Like okay that's, that's very interesting. So he would get our attention like that. This is crack cocaine. This is cocaine. Now tell us how you get from here to there. So he caught our attention. Maybe not with the best examples, but he got our attention. So try to find the best teachers. Try to find the interesting teachers. Go to the subject you're studying, find something which is interesting to you, find the best uh, best teachers for it as well. And look, what, should, what should I do if I'm academically stupid? That's a, that's a very vague question. Or, you know, this, this is a very loaded question. A person sometimes is not the smartest because he does not apply himself to his studies. He does not apply himself. He's just hoping that he's going to do good. I remember when I got to see Jeff, my entire high school I just coached it through. 90s, I didn't even, like, friend would tell me, we have a final exam. I'm like, oh, it's good that you told me. We have 15 minutes left, let me open my books. And I do my last minute study for my final exam in, the, in that 15 minutes. That was the beginning, that was the end of it. When I got into see Jeff, the story was very different. Then I couldn't just hope that I would learn everything in 15 minutes. So my first exam, I got killed, meaning I got a 78%. Yeah, that, that's my definition, getting killed in a math course. If it's anything less than 95, then it's a problem. So I had to keep up with it. And Rasulullah Sallallahu says, he tells us, he tells us about certain amal, but he tells us a principle. Just make sure the fat is all on the camera. He tells us, Ahabul Amal Allah, the, the most beloved deeds to Allah are the ones which are most regular, even if they be a bit less. So, this is a concept which specifically is talking about deen, but it's a principle which extends in a person's daily life. Anything that a person does consistently will be a benefit. So whether it be his studies, instead of just hoping that you're going to 
you know, master everything when you cram in the end. Rather, you look at your, the material every day for 10, 15 minutes. But the one more time, keep doing it consistently, even if it's a bit less. 10, 15 minutes every day, 10, 15 minutes every day. Review your calculus, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. At the end of the semester, even though you thought you were academically stupid, you're going to find that, hey, I'm not that bad. And those kids that used to pull off 1995 in high school, well, just because of the sheer amount of material that's being delivered in, in college and university, they can no longer rely on their ability to cram at the end. And that person who is following this guidance, which came through the Sunnah, he is actually doing much, much better. So take the wisdom, take the guidance that came from Rasulullah So follow something, study something that you like, so study something which interests you. Find the best teachers, but from your side, bring those practices which will give the best results. Now getting into financial dealings. So a person needs to ensure his earnings are halal. Allah will ask us, we will be asked from where we earned our wealth and where and upon what we spent it. These are things that the feet of the son of Adam will not be allowed, permitted to move until he answers these questions. So these are two of the questions that will be asked. So financial dealings are very important. So question are asked, if I have a cat, can I sell it? Or is it better to simply give it away? And would it be permissible to do a business of buying and selling cats? So there is a hadith that you know one person he asked Jabir radiallahu anhu an thamani al-kalb wa sinnawr qal zajar al-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an dhalik I asked Jabir radiallahu anhu about the price of dogs and cats he said that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam disapproved of that disapproved of it so Imam Nawawi rahmatullah he says that the meaning of this hadith is that it is makru tanzi, it is undesirable to sell cats. <coughs> so a person can do it, he can do it. But if there's something otherwise that you can do which is not criticized, then it is better. But nonetheless, it is permissible. So if you are presented with the option of working in a bank or selling cats, option to sell cats. But if you're given the option of selling cats and doing something which is completely halal, then offer the, that thing which is completely halal, rather than that thing which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he disapproved of. Is drop shipping halal? So drop shipping is it's, it's a type of you know, contract, type of you know, process where a person advertises, advertises a product and he sells it without this product actually coming into his hands. This is what dropshipping is. Now there are um, considerations where a person can appoint wakils, he can appoint legal representatives along the way, or he can be someone else's legal representative along the way of something. Like for example, if I am selling on behalf. I am a salesman for a bigger company. So I am allowed to sell their things even though that thing is not in my hands. Say that I'm selling showers. So I am allowed to sell showers because I am representing Flurco or whatever company. Now, if I'm just selling it, but I'm not their legal representative, I'm not their salesman, then Sharia has prohibited Selling that which you do not possess. So that is problematic. And dropshipping, we have looked at contracts. This is a, a matter which is, you know, as many people ask. So we have looked at different contracts of dropshippers. And many of these times when people talk about dropshipping, then these companies that they're working with, they explicitly state that you are not our representative. You are not our representative. So that makes that that point of view problematic. Because I'm not complete, I cannot be acting as his salesman. I can pretend to be, but in reality, he himself is putting on paper that you are not my you are not my salesman. 
Now, there is the possibility of bay'a salam, which is when a person, this is something which Sharia has permitted, that a person, he can sell something which he does not possess when it is detailed in many ways. You know, the exact description of the product is detailed, the time and place of delivery is detailed, and the mode of delivery and so on. There's many, many things which are detailed about it. When all these things are specified, then it can fall under the heading of Bayer Salam. So, one angle which we have not looked into is the one when this, this company, they are sending the product to the person who buys it. If the shipping company is acting on behalf of the person who did this whole transaction, then they are acting as the one who makes up of that product, the one who takes ownership, he takes possession of that product before delivering it to the buyer. In that situation, if that can be established and like all the other qualities of the product which you are selling can be established, then there can be scope in it. But if the shipper is not acting and cannot be considered to be acting on behalf of the one who's advertising the product and who's selling it, then drop, in, drop shipping would be problematic as well. So that is um, a sort of loophole, you know, as, you, as you put it, as the questioner puts it, to make a halal. Look, we're never praying, we're never playing with loopholes with Allah. That's, that's some bunny Israel stunts. We don't, we don't play that. You know, we do what is what Deen talks about, what Allah and Rasul demand from us. I can trick the world, but how am I going to trick Allah? Can't do that. So we just have to make sure that whatever we're doing is clean. If everything along the way is detailed properly and it fits the bill of Bayer Salam, so you know, if someone is interested in this and they can bring us their contracts, so we do have people who are very talented in these lines who can actually go through the contracts and make sure that everything is clean. So when the time comes, you know, it's not something I can just, I mean, I can sort of explain at a high level here, but when it really comes down to the details of it, you'd have to bring it to us and then we can give you a more, uh, more detailed answer and a more, uh, more specific and a more accurate answer based on your situation. Is making a credit card permissible? So generally the issue with making, with making a credit card or having a credit card is that a person agrees to pay riba. That's the problem. That's where problematic aspect would come in. That there is a facet clause in this contract. There's a problematic clause in this contract. So, you know, the, the main body, the main body of the contract is, you know, this, this, it's relatively clean. That a person will buy something, he will pay back the full amount before the before that, you know, the due date, and there will be no there will be no riba on it. Now there's a problematic clause which comes that the person agrees to pay riba. So, if a person can avoid this situation, there's scope. What is safer is if a person can get a prepaid credit card, or you know, like. Any of our brothers last year, or you know, the, the hundred before, they were not able to make their payments, you know, with a regular credit card. They had to use a debit credit card, Visa debit or whatever Mastercard debit card, which was it, it's it's a Visa, it's a Mastercard, but it's linked back to their bank account. So whatever they actually possess, they can pay that. You know, nowadays when a person actually needs to, he needs a credit card for so many things, you know, it kind of becomes borderline necessity ish. So there's scope for a person to get a credit card. But if we can save ourselves at several levels by getting a prepaid or by getting a debit credit card, then this is safer and this is even better. But even without that, if a person is certain, he's confident that he can avoid falling to riba, there's scope for it. But if he's not confident, then save yourself from riba and stay away from it. Can we sell fake branded products such as purses or soccer jerseys or watches? 
the buyer knows it's fake and chooses to pay a lower price compared to if he was buying an original. So again, I'm never going to encourage you to do something which is illegal. So do follow the laws of the land. These, you know, there's some laws which are required, which require us to disobey Allah. Do not disobey Allah. Those laws which do not require you to disobey Allah, follow through with them. Oh, forbid our You know, fulfill your your contracts and your what you have agreed to, your agreements. So when we came here, we agreed to certain things. Those things which are not against the commandments of Allah, you know, stick to them. And do not deceive people. Some people might know that it's not real, but you know, once we start getting into that game, then you see that, mashallah, you know, making some good money on this, and I can, you know, making you know two two hundred percent profit, but I'm selling this this knockoff door number good. And if I you know make it just a bit better and I sell it off as a real one, now I could be making twenty times. Now Shaitan, he knows how to play with us. So rather, Sadhu Sarai, close this and close the ways of doing you know, these questionable things. Is crypto and Bitcoin halal in Islam? Alright. So crypto and Bitcoin. So there are various crypto assets that have exist. There are various crypto assets that exist. There's Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a whole bunch of them. Solana, Luna, you name it. Some were good, some were not good. Some burned people. So you have to see what the crypto asset is. Is it inherently problematic or not? There are some crypto assets which are meant as backbones for gambling. Those are already haram. haram. Those are already haram. There are some which are inherently made as, as uh, backbones for adult entertainment. Those are outright haram. Now there are others which are this scope. There's nothing, there's, the, there's nothing immediately noticeable, problematic, which is within them. So amongst those which are not inherently problematic, the general consensus amongst the ulama is now they're, they're considering them as from what I am seeing in the ulama that I'm following, they, they're giving some scope of you know, permissibility in them. There remains a debate whether they're considered currency or commodity. The, the way we deal with currency is different than the way we deal with commodities. So if a person is selling a car, it's dealt with differently than if a person is doing forex trading. They're dealt with differently. If a person is buying, selling silver and gold, it's different than if a person is selling flour and sugar. So there's a de there's a debate going on. You know, there's further consideration going on. Further research going on. Is it is crypto uh, and the different crypto assets are they currency or are they commodity? So those that do have problematic aspects in it are seen to be generally Sharia com compliant. But remember that these are relatively new and a fatwa is given on the reality that is available about them. What is it? What is that thing in reality? What is that thing in reality? So, as we are understanding the reality of a thing more and more, the you know the ruling on it may change. This is based on what the reality is. So, you know, as be ready that maybe the opinion might change. It's not because people do not know the fundamental principles of Sharia. Uh, you know. Islamic banking, Islamic finance are established. But an opinion is given based on what is the reality of this thing. And if it is, if our understanding changes, then the rule might change. Now concerning ibadah and worship, the fundamental religious observances. So questioner mentions, I have started experiencing a weird feeling recently. Every time I go to the masjid, I feel anxiety and panic within my body, as if I were dizzy or short of breath. As soon as I leave the masjid, it gets better soon after. If this is in fact the case, then uh, maybe you want to be in touch with me, we'll, we'll refer you to someone for some ruqya. Because, I mean, 
we have observed Rukhya being done and we've observed people going through this where the person who was possessed actually did jump at me and try to attack me. And then once the Rukhya was done, then the person had no awareness that they, any of this had happened. So if this is in fact the case, which is, you know, Rukhya is not my forte, so I have referred to someone else. But if this is in fact the case, then uh, get in touch with me or after or email me or whatever from our website and so we'll try to refer you to someone. Before I had a better relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I used to talk to him in my du'as and take my time in salat. But now I feel that relationship isn't at the same level anymore. Look, the reality of any relationship is the same. The reality of any relationship is the same. You know, back in the day, when I was a newlywed, you know, I used to call my wife and we used to talk for an hour, an hour and a half every day, and you know, so on and so forth. And then, you know, as the realities of life, so to speak, came in, you know, it became less frequent, less time, we're all you know, she was busy in this, or, you know. I'm, I'm not specifically talking about my life, I'm talking about, you know, any married person could be like, yeah, you know, he sounds like he's talking about us, right? So, definitely, <coughs> the more you invest in a relationship, the more it will remain strong. The more you remain aloof, the more you remain separated, the more you, know, you get this. Thing. So, how are we going to work on this? We have to make an effort bring ourselves in an environment where we are remembering the those things where the beauty of Allah are being highlighted from us. We remind ourselves, we listen, we, we talk about it. We listen to the gifts of Allah, we listen to the blessings of Allah. The one questioner had asked again previously about the names and attributes of Allah. How can we learn them? How can we bring them into our lives? The more we do it, the more we will find ourselves getting closer to this is amongst the best things that I can advise is that you know, push yourself. You know, after a person he, he he grows distant and aloof from someone, now it kind of becomes you know, awkward that you know, I haven't seen my friend in two months and you know, we've just not been seeing each other like, yo, oh, how are you doing? And you know, the same way we used to talk to each other, you know, the same way we felt close, it's different. But how are you going to refresh that? Now you force yourself. You know, let's, why, don't we, why don't we take them time out? Let's, let's grab a bite to eat. Let's talk. Let's catch up. And remember how things were back in the good old days. And like that, you know, we, we refresh these, the, these good memories. Just in the same way we refresh the good memories of what Allah has been doing for us. What Allah has done for us. How Allah is always taking care of us. How we would ask Allah. The more we do that, we will find ourselves getting closer and closer. So there's no there's no two ways about it. Increase our zikr of Allah. Increase our talking about Allah. Push ourselves to recite more from the Quran. Try to understand what we are reciting. All these things will help us. How can I increase the baraka in my time? Generally, baraka, there's a direct correlation between baraka and nearness to Allah and our obedience to Allah, staying away from disobedience. There's a direct correlation. A person wants to increase baraka in his life, in his wealth, in his time, he increases his obedience to Allah. He stays away from disobedience to Allah. One of the things that our ulama and our mashayikh have found that the more barakah you want in your time, the more you should spend time in the Quran. The more you should read the Quran by looking in it. You will find more and more barakah. This is something that our ulama they have experienced along with increasing the needs of Allah, saying good for the needs, and this one to increase our Barakah. Question number 
us here mention that journey on the kids' journey. Sometimes I recite the sentence of verse in multiple sittings and I forgot. I forgot the base of the, or I forgot how many sittings I must, I must do. So generally when we talk about a city, as many times as a person was, is within one general area, say that a person was, you know, he was sitting in the back of the class, he came to his teacher to recite, he in the back he recited the Sajda Ayat 20 times, then he came to his teacher who recited it 3 times, and so on and so forth. All this is considered one sitting still. Now if he got up, he went to the toilet, he came back, this is considered a second sitting. So now if a person, he's legitimately doesn't know how many sittings he's done, how many, uh, how many times he's recited these ayat of sajda, then these ayat are still doing these sajdas are still doing So he should do his best to guesstimate whatever there was and try to fulfill it. He should try to make them up, make toba for whatever he was, whatever he missed. Knowledge. Seeking knowledge is a fundamental obligation on every believer. And without without which, without seeking knowledge, no action will be acceptable. So there's Hadith about the one who goes out to seek knowledge and dies would go to paradise. Does that apply to scholars or regular people as well? Generally any this is this is a concept which we find in the this is a general principle that we find indeed that a person would set out with an intention and whether he was able to fulfill that intention or not, we have hope in the mercy of Allah that Allah will accept it from him. There is that famous hadith that we read in Sahih Muslim and Riyadh Sahih about that person who had killed 99 people. And he asked about the most knowledgeable person. They sent him to one, you know, one uncle in the masjid. And he said that, no, you killed our 99 people, impossible. And he made, so he got mad, he killed it, made it 100. Now after making a nice round number, he started feeling bad again. So he went back, he said, show me, guide me to the most knowledgeable person, and they guided him to a scholar. He said, for sure, Allah can forgive you, but you're in a bad place. You're in a bad place, the people around you are bad. You need to get out of here. You need to go to a good place. So what he does is he makes, makes his way up. And as he's going on, as he's on his way, he was a different he reaches approximately halfway. And then he dies. He never reached that destination. So long story short, Allah forgave him, even though he never reached that destination. So this is a general principle that when a person sets out with an intention, Allah will our hope and our expectation from the mercy of Allah is that Allah fulfills it. So inshallah we said we we set out with this intention. If a person is going out to seek knowledge of deen, when we talk about knowledge, then we talk about knowledge of deen. If a regular person was going out to become an alim, or he's going out to increase his knowledge of deen, maybe he's coming you know, for the intensive course, maybe he's coming to sit in Wednesday night Dallas of Tafsir with Allah Muhammad Akbar. Inshallah, and he dies along the way. And his intention was that just like Mawana Akbar's intention is that we're going to keep this dose of the tafsir going, whether it lasts 10, 15 years, but we're going to cover the entire Quran from beginning to end. This is the objective of this dose of tafsir. Quote is right there. Shameless pitch, sorry about that. But person goes with this intention, inshallah Allah will give, inshallah our expectation is Allah will fulfill his, his expectation. Can you quickly explain in four schools of thoughts and what they are? I can't quickly explain to you. <laughs> I can't. What I can tell you quickly is that every one of these four schools of thought are based on Quran and Sunnah. Every single one of them is based on Quran and Sunnah. There is no one who is randomly pulling things out of his back pocket. None of them. They have their own thought process. And it is not fair to try to explain their thought process you know, you know, in, a, in a rapid fire type setting. 
This requires, when we say usul al-fiqh, we're going to spend, we're going to cover a couple of books on the usul al-fiqh, just of the ahnaf, as we studied. And then someone's going to do it according to the Shafi school of thought, according to Maliki school of thought, and Hanbali school of thought. Each one of these is an entire session. Entire, like, long session. So it is unjust to try to shrink it into rapid fire. But what is established, what we should be confident about is every one of them is based on a Quran and Sunnah. Where are they? They're a thought process. So question and ask, why does Islam have four sects? They're not sects. Uh, madhab is a school of thought. It is a thought process through which apparent contradictions are resolved. That's what happens in a school of thought. What is, what is clearly established, no one is going to disagree on it. No one is going to disagree on it. Everyone agrees on it because it's clear in Quran and Sunnah. Now when, there, when there's a bit more up to discussion, then based on the thought process of the ulama behind it, they, will, they might come to different conclusions. They might come to different conclusions. So that's what they are. They're not sects. Each one of them are coming based solidly on Quran and Sunnah. I also don't understand which one to choose because I have multiple mosques in my house. Wherever you have access to ulama of a certain school of thought, follow that. Don't follow deen according to your whims and fancies and your desires. Because that's what happens when a person, he decides from his side, I'm going to follow Quran and Hadith myself. I don't need ulama. Then he's going to follow, he'll find one Hadith which he does not understand. Or he doesn't understand the implications of it. And he's going to start following his whims and fancies. And what that hadith is telling him has nothing to do with what he understood. And this happened to us. Yes, there was one brother in summer, and he was, you know, he was, mashallah, he was very comfortable going to sunnah.com and he would find hadith of Sahih Muslim. And then he would interpret, he would start deriving his own rulings, reading the English translation. Reading the English translation. And brother is telling people that brother, you don't even have to make mas, you can mas- make mas on different things. You and Hadith is telling you Rasulullah so also made mas of his forehead. Like bro. Al Jabha min al Waj. The forehead is from your face. He didn't make mas of his forehead. This guy is messing up his own wudu, he's messing up other people's wudu. Bro, please. So wherever you have ulama, you're comfortable with the ulama, follow that. Those people who are coming here, follow the Sanabi Madhab. If you know the Shafi'i Madhab, by all means. For us, it is our fakhr, it is our honor that people will stand up and will revive the ilm of our ulama here. And there was one time one brother, he told me, he asked me, can I make Adhan. I said, sure. But you're going to be making Adhan. I want you to make Adhan on the madhab of Imam Malik. And those who know the Imam, the Adhan of the, the madhab of Imam Malik, it's Allah Akbar twice at the beginning. Yeah, they only do it twice. And we know that. That's why he was going to, when he did it, people like, I am like, can't relax. He's doing it according to the madhab of Imam Malik. This is my honor that the Imam. The ilm of Imam Malik is being revived in my masjid. It's my honor that it is being revived. So if you know what you're doing, by all means. If you don't know what you're doing, follow the ulama. Here, you don't know, your ulama are from the Hanafi school of thought. If we happen to be in the Emirates and the ulama are from the Maliki Madhab, then I'm going to tell you, follow the Maliki Madhab. Because that's where the ulama are there who can help you, who can give you the right rulings. So whatever the ulama has, whatever the ulama are there, follow that. So can you just summarize them for me to simplify my choice? No, I can't. Simply follow with the ulama of if the, the ulama were present. Take what they have to say. Conceptually, you're allowed to choose, but it's not, you know, it's not a practical decision to choose something. It's like a person he chooses who wants to buy a car and he wants to choose a car that parts are not available in this country. You have the choice, but you're going to have a difficult time. So choose a car whose parts are available to you so easily. Wait, what's
What's your thought regarding Medina University? Can one still study there if you have to study Arabic and practice Quran and read and benefit from the scholarships? Look, I'm, I'm never going to, unless I know something inherently problematic about, about a place, I'm never going to tell someone don't study there. But what was the practice of the ulama was to study with their local ulama first. And once they had gained whatever they can from their local ulama, then they would go further out. It was never that they would go to the, you know, I felt that I'm going to go to the big shops first. I'm going to, you, are, you guys are too small fries for me, I'm not going to deal with you. I'm going to deal with the big shots. So generally, we would advise people, take from your local ulama. They will give you attention at a personal level which will not necessarily be le- possible in a bigger setting. There's some madaris, they have five, six hundred students. Teachable. Forget about your name, you might not even recognize your face. But when you sit with your local ulama, then there will be his personal connection. And this is what Sahaba the Sahaba, they had the sohbah, they had the company of Rasulullah So it's best that you take the company of your local ulama first. You gain as much energy from them as you can first, and then you go for the rest. With all the fitna around us, it is so hard to tell what is part of Islam and what isn't, such as women's rights, their exam, for example, education, work rights, etc. And we weren't told enough about what Islam believes versus what society is teaching us. It's very confusing. I can't comment further when you come here when we, we address these points. So come here and shall be addressed. But yes, you know, society is telling us one thing. And just growing up here, we grow up with local biases. We are presented that you know, this rights are the best, and those rights are the best, and so on and so forth. But we have to come back to our Islamic And this is actually a very, there's so much to be done about this that you know, these harms are reaching us at a societal level. So what does Islam consider an adult? It considers someone who's badil as an adult, not someone who's 18 plus. Now because we have considered, we the Muslims, we the Muslims have considered someone who's 17 is not an adult yet. Say he's not an adult yet. When he's going to become 18, then he will be an adult. But he's being faced with the desires of adults. He's being faced with the needs of adults, but we are not treating him like an adult. We're treating him as a child. So as he grows up, he still thinks he's a child. Because that's what we have taught him. That's We have treated him that way, and that's what he has learned, that I'm still a child. So this is inappropriate. So yes, we have to come back. And these are topics that we address here. So inshallah, you know, keep dropping by and keep on addressing these topics here. But this is really something which is necessary to understand what does Islam say about all these different aspects. Because it will shape our worldview. It will shape our view of this life and everything around it. So we have to come back to our deen. And this, inshallah, we can get from our ulama. So along with learning the wajibat and the akran of salat and you know what breaks and what doesn't break wudu, we will also touch upon these things. So make it a point, inshallah, we sit and we get an opportunity. And now we're getting to one of the topics that everybody's interested in, marriage. So completing half of one's deed, and fearing Allah concerning the other half. Okay, is it halal to flirt with an AI? All right, so parents, take note. This is a question. <laughs> Parents, please take note. This is real. This is not It's not permitted. It's not permitted. Allah says, Allah ta'ala Now, although AI is not inherently where to where things will go down the line, but this is actually something which is <coughs> happening. This is actually something that is happening. And people are developing developing feelings towards these AIs. And as AIs are now, you know, from being computer software, now with a little bit of 
hardware and then a little bit of you know firmware so to speak you know it's it's going to take a very days so be very very mindful of this and so if anyone asks flirting with ai is highly problematic sharia wise even non sharia wise is problematic question or ask. I have a question about lowering the gaze. Sometimes when you look at the ground, you are more likely to be staring at their uncovered legs. Would it be better to speak while looking at their face? But their face is also very beautiful. The brothers are laughing, but I have actually experienced this myself. We went, we actually went to, you know, we make it a point that we go and we try to visit the brothers of the community. So we knocked on one house and there's a big dog that rushed and there was like a glass window. So the big dogs, like it surprised us. And then to our surprise, there comes a leg there that removes the dog. We're like, oh, oh, we're not supposed to be looking at that. And then the door opens. So lowering the gaze, Yes, we're supposed to do that. But if you're going to be a problem looking up and looking down and looking up, then just look at this way or did that way. Don't look at the face. And definitely do not be looking at the legs. Look this way or that way. Guard your gaze. All right? We're clear about that? Okay. Now this is a very serious comment. So before we address this comment, I wanted parents to be aware of what the children, what the youth are being faced with. So yes, youth are being faced with something that parents who grew up back in the country, they will not, they cannot grasp it. They cannot understand it. And now being someone who is like getting out of my youth, getting into slightly older age, I know what the youth are going through. And I know that, you know, kind of tamed down as you get a bit older. So, someone who's a bit older, they're not going to experience the same, whatever you want to call it, as what a youth might experience. But it's a very valid comment. These kids that think that marriage is a joke and over-romanticize it, it's sad that they don't realize how big of a responsibility it is. So I guess it's more of a comment, but it's something that I will entertain, because that is correct. Yes, marriage, we feel the need for it. But marriage includes several aspects. It, yes, it is, it does. Rasulullah says, So he said that the one who is capable of the physical and the financial uh, you know, obligations, let him get married because it helps him guard his gaze and it helps him preserve his chastity. But the one who is unable to take care of these responsibilities, alayhi bisawm, let him fast, let him fast, let him fast, because that is a grinding, a castration, it is a protection from his all into his, into his desires. So yes, it is the responsibility of Rasulullah tells us about this responsibility. That who is able, whoever is able to take care of this responsibility, let him fulfill this responsibility. And he mentions that he'll save pardon from zina. So now, what I want to bring to the attention of the elders is that Be in touch with the youth. Be in touch with the youth. You will be surprised to know that a guy with a beard in the MSA of his college, with a sister wearing a hijab in the MSA of their college, have fallen into zina. You don't believe me get news from the grapevine. Is this true? 
is for real. So they are faced with it. They are faced with it. And marriage is also a social responsibility. There's no doubt about that. And now what I want to throw on to the parents, they're raising children that come from marriage is also a responsibility. So we have to raise them with this Islamic mindset, this Islamic worldview. Coming back to the question that we don't know what to do, what, is, what are the rights of this, what are the rights of that? When do I treat my child as an adult? When I, how long do I treat him as a child? All of that has to be considered. Because the reality is that we have grown up with the romantic idea of love and relationship. And that's what we were exposed to. If that's what we're exposed to, what do you think the children, the, they're growing up, they imagine that when I get married, that I'm gonna have, I'm gonna be with my husband, my wife, so on and so forth, and we're going, it's going to be such a rosy time, and we're going to be living so, we're gonna be living happily ever after. You can be living happily ever after and take care of the marriage. If not, that's a problem. So parents as well, as society, meaning the massages, meaning the society, extended society, we need to come together and we need to provide the youth with that tarbiya which will raise them as proper adults that they can get married when they need to. Seeing what's around them, seeing what they're falling into, how can I save them? Because if I'm not going to do my job as a parent, and I, I'm going to criticize my children that they want to get married at 16, they want to get married because of what they're exposed to. If I'm just going to throw up, you know, artificial blocks, or maybe they're real blocks, maybe they are serious concerns, but if I'm not doing anything to, to, redress, to address those concerns, then ultimately at the end of the day, someone's going to make a mistake, someone's going to slip, someone's going to fall. So as a society, we have to come together and we have to do better. What is masculinity according to Islam? Well, it's not what the left has told us. And I don't think it's necessarily what Andrew Tate tells us. Rather, masculinity in Islam is what Rasulullah has established. Gender roles exist. Gender roles exist in Islam. That's for real. The man, he has to earn for the family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stipulated the man is the awam. He is the one who maintains the family in terms of their finances and in terms of their head. He is the head of the family. Absolutely. And as a leader, he deserves respect. And now as a leader, he has to lead the family. He has to lead the family. And at the same time, no, any leader, he is between two places. He wants to establish what he needs, but he has to be soft enough to do it without breaking his people. So both of these things have to be done. He has to take care of it. So at the same time, you know, he cannot be weak. He cannot be flimsy. So, you know, generally, a lot of what we're hearing on a red pill, there's a lot of it which is on point. Although, I wouldn't necessarily refer you fully that route because there's nothing unless we're talking about what Dean demands from us. But in this time when people, when men are made to be softer, then no, men have to be, they have to be chivalrous, they have to be taking care of those around them, they have to be taking care of their wives, they have to be taking care of the children of the family, they have to be leaders, they have to be you know, providing for them, they have to be doing the tatiya. All of these things are included. But this is a much longer topic. So we're gonna have to we're gonna require a separate session just on the full details of this. 
But one thing I'm telling you, it's neither what the left tells you, and it's, not, it's neither what fully what Andrew Tate tells you. It's somewhere in between. If you want to understand, you have to keep coming back to what Allah and the Rasul has told us, and that is where the deed is. And like we've mentioned, the height and the pinnacle of women's rights is not feminism, it is Islam. And the height and the pinnacle of men's responsibilities is not red pill, and it's not the left, it is Islam. The height and the pinnacle of anyone's rights and responsibility is Islam, and we have to give our due to learn from this. We can learn it. We go to Ramadan and we ask them. Can you give a step-by-step -step detailed instruction on how to get married? Start from step zero. And what's the best way to approach a sister for marriage? Bro, this was covered in the marriage seminar. So, and this is actually a very long discussion, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentions that a woman is married for several reasons. She is, she is married for her wealth, she is married for her beauty, she is married for her lineage, or she is married for her deen. So he says, take the one who has deen. Marry, grab that one. Grab that one who has deen. That doesn't mean that you have to exclude, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to say, you know, you have to exclude beauty. Like, no, no, she can't be beautiful. May Allah like, give you guys all beautiful wives. May Allah like, give our sisters downstairs who are looking for a husband, good, pious, handsome husbands. Look for the one who has deen. What is the best way to approach a sister? Look, when Khadija Allah one had wanted to send a proposal for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he was her employee. He was Mudarib. She was Arabul Mal. He was Mudarib. She could have been like, hey, and what about? Uh, I was thinking of getting married. But so she had the responsibility for family to send a message to Rasulullah. So if you want to get married, do, you look, do your due diligence and actually have include your parents in it. This is the number one thing that I can advise you. Have your parents involved throughout the process. How many times I've seen that youth get together and they get emotionally attached to each other and they think that they're you know they're ride or die, they think they're ever they're gonna to be together forever and then just something goes wrong. And then they turn their backs. And the family, the parents that this youth had been turning his back on because of this one that he is so in love with. Now he goes back. So make it a point that you keep your parents on board. Look for these things. And if the parents are on, on board and you've done your background check, have your women do a background check. A lot can be found in social media. You can see what's up with this, this person's life. You see her TikTok, and you see that she's dancing to TikTok in front of, you know, in front of guys, girls, and you're like, okay, we have a problem here. And if you see the guy, you know, he's, you know, he's showing off how he's, how he's a player, and you know, the, the gangster rap and this and that. You're like, all right, is this what I really want from my potential husband for my sister? Probably not. So do your, do do your due diligence. Once due diligence is done and there's nothing problematic, then have a discussion on a high level things. What is your long term objective? Long term objective? Is this person a family person? Is this person a career person? We have to see what. We have to see that are, are we on the same wavelength? Or am I thinking that um, I'm a family person and she is thinking that she's fully geared towards her career? And we're going to have disagreements from the beginning. So these are things that we have to consider. And have, have your family involved while approaching the sister. How to avoid marrying a modern liberal Muslim? Well, that's partly where this high level discussion goes on. And I'm not specifically talking about guy or girl, it's whoever there is. It might be a modern liberal Muslim guy, it might be a modern Muslim, liberal Muslim girl, whatever the story is. We want to understand their mindset. Are they traditional mindset? Are they modern, liberal mindset? So this is a discussion you want to have. 
oriented? Are they more concerned? Are they more conservative? Are they family oriented, or so on? Or do they want to, you know, my money is mine and your money is mine? Where did you come up with this? <laughs> Just because you heard this in social media, you're repeating this. This is not deep. Your money is yours. And whatever the man has to provide for the family, and what nafaka he gives her is hers. Yes, but he can also keep some money for himself, and that's not. <coughs> That is not yours. And the, and the woman is meant to preserve and safeguard the wealth of her husband. And the, the husband is meant to take care of his wife. So we have to come back to what deen wants from us. Is our foundation deen or is our foundation something else? How to marry an iqabi if my family doesn't like the idea of marrying an iqabi? Well, Get them on board. Figure it out. You have to convince them. Just like you might have had to convince your parents to buy you a PS5. Yeah, you convince them. You wanted it. They're like, no. You want PS5? No. No discussion. You want them? No, no PS5. Say, Dad, please, Mom, please. I want to do the dishes every night. I don't want to do this. I want to get 19%. In. I'm going to study every day for 10 minutes, cover all my subjects, and I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to mow the lawn, and I'm going to, I want to take care of the little siblings, and this and that. And get them on board. Get them on board. I don't know what the other reasons are for which they're objecting. <coughs> that would be uh, material to the discussion. How do I get married in a situation where parents believe one should finish his studies and find a job and make money, then get married after your prime young days are gone? Well, <clears throat> they have to be introduced to what's happening in reality. What can I say? This is why whenever we talk about marriage, we talk about the realities that the youth are facing. Because this is a reality. Are, are you happy that your child should get married after he's committed zina? Is this what you would? Is this what pleases you? Is this what pleases you? If not, think seriously. Think hard. We have to completely re, you know, reframe the structure of raising our children. This is a reality to our parents. This is a reality to the young parents. This is a reality to the youth that we have to change the way we're looking at things. I'm not a child at 13 years old. I am an adult. The world might tell me I'm a child, but I'm an adult. I have to be responsible. This is the way we have to, you know, change things up. And you bring them to your local onama. Bring, bring them to those people around you who are aware of what's happening, who can, you know, can convince them, who can at least present it to them. Allah save our generation. Am I allowed to get married, but we both live in our own homes for the first few months or a year? Let's go for it. It's not the best case scenario, but if a person finds that they're not going to be able to preserve their chastity, and they want to go this route, just get your parents on board. Just get your parents on board. Because they will make sure, they will facilitate whatever else happens along the line. There will be differences. There will be misunderstandings that will happen along the way. And just for context, Aisha Rasulullah tells Aisha Rasulullah, I know when you are happy with me, I know when you're unhappy with me. He says, how is that? He said, when you're happy with me, you swear by the Lord of Muhammad. And when you're unhappy with me, you swear by the Lord of Ibrahim. So, I used to know. So it is established that Aisha and Allah would at times be unhappy with Rasulullah And you have you're hoping that your marriage is going to be a better rose. You have perfection personified, and his his wife is sometimes unhappy. And you're hoping your wife will always be happy. It's not gonna happen. So make sure that your parents are on board because they're gonna help you with things when there's the differences, when there's this and that, it's going to be going on. But there is scope for it. So make sure that you are seeing each other now that you are married. Make sure you are seeing each other. You remain in contact with each other. 
when we lose contact, that's when we lose this this connection that was there. Just like when we lose contact with Allah, the disappearance which we experience, it starts slipping away. When we lose contact with our spouse, then same thing. After marriage, how do I, how do I as a Muslim go to the door in my protection of very stressful situations? Or the wrong word. <laughs> I've heard that while being intimate with one spouse, it is better not to look at each other's nudity and be done with quick. Is this true? Look, Rasulullah is mentioned about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the neighbor, looked at Aisha radi Allah as a private part and, like, and vice versa. But it is not impermissible. So spouses should be satisfying each other. So it, nest, it need not be done quickly. But it is permissible to look at one spouse. Is role play halal? As long as it's with your spouse and you ain't role playing something else which is impermissible, it hasn't been explicitly forbidden. In a scenario where you have more than one wife, can you like one more than the other? So there are certain things that a person can control. He controls how much time he spends with one wife and how much, and he must be fair in this, how much he gives to each wife, how much he spends on each wife. He is, he doesn't have the capacity on his heart. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to mention, he used to make this about the Ya Allah, I have done whatever justice I am capable of doing. You know, only for what I am capable of, meaning in terms of the love that he has. He had a special love for Aisha radi Allah which was not the same for the other wives. There was nothing that he could do about it. But Allah says, وَلَا تَذَرُوهَا كَالْمُعَلَّقَ Do not leave her hanging. That you've only gone one way and then you've forgotten the others. Do what you can to be fair. But there are certain things you cannot control. And if you happen to love one more than the other, it is what it is. But what you are capable of being fair about, be fair about. Miscellaneous. Okay, so this is not necessarily complete. Out. This is just general thing. Sure. How to escape the matrix according to Islam? Allah says, Believe in Allah, believe in the unseen, believe in the promises that Allah has put, you will escape the matrix. You want to escape the matrix, you want to es- es- you know, escape the systems that others have put in place to control you. Follow the commandments of Allah. Put your trust in the commandments of Allah. You will find that you will find a, you will find a solution out. So the matrix and so on is not particularly my terminology. But what really look others who talk about escaping the matrix, who do they talk about? Riding around in the Bugattis and in their and their this and that. Is that escaping anything? You are still a slave to dunya. Unless Rasulullah sallallahu says, a dunya sijrul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. The dunya is the prison of a believer and jannah for the disbeliever. So, you're just following the same formula that the non-believers are following. Come to what Allah and His have told you is good. Go after the akhirah. That's how you're going to escape the matrix. But you're not going to go after the Akhirah until you have Yaqeen. وَبِلْ أَخِرَةِ هُمْ يُقِنُونَ Until you have Yaqeen in it. That's how you're going to escape the matrix. Who is the best poet to benefit from? Which language you're talking? My Urdu is garbage. So I can't really help you with that. I think Iqbal is apparently supposed to be good, but I can't speak with authority. <coughs> in terms of Arabic, Hassan ibn Thabit radiallahu anhu was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa lyrical assassin. He was the one who would make hijab on behalf of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He had his own member in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you know, This is what they would try to do. You know, they were very strong in language at that time. So the mushrikeen, they would come and they would try to bring their poem where they would try to, you know, they, would, they would bring their distracts to attack Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa so Abu Bakr radiallahu knowing the lineages, he would say, and you know, the Arabs were all connected. It's like what? he's connected to, he's disconnected, 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 connected in that generation. Disconnected, disconnected. So he passed this knowledge on to Hassan and radiallahu And he would attack this one, this one, this one. Oh, there's a connection here? He made this guy alone. And then attack this one, this one. 
So he wanted and where he praised Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Hassan bin Sa'ad was going to be Allah and we'll find good stuff on his side. And then Imam Shafi, he has his own diwan. You'll we'll find good stuff in there. There's allegedly a, a diwan of Ali radiallahu anhu. The, all the poetry there cannot authentically be attributed back to him. So I can't authentic, you know, with authority tell you all that. But these other ones. Is watching a TV show, example, comedy, Egyptian comedy, permissible? If I am a sister, there's girls not wearing hijab, and it maybe has to do with family's life. The actors may be both men and women. Look, I'm not going to encourage you to watch TV. There's problematic aspects with it. But if a person is hell bent that he's going to watch TV one way or another, and it's either going to be something highly problematic, or it's going to be something less problematic, then that shows good values. You know, there was, at one point, there was this, uh, I think it was a Turkish anime or something like that called Erdogan, which apparently had some good principles and so on in it. I don't know if that's what it was, but that's what I've heard about it. I never watched it myself. But generally, try to spend your time doing something more productive. And in terms of a sister looking at another uh, another Muslim woman without her hijab on. For, you know, between Muslim women, the aura is different. But in terms of looking at random guys, and especially if we're looking at random guys without their shirts on and so on, that's not exactly appropriate. Can I go to non-Muslim funerals? If it's a religious gathering, stay away. We should not be attending any religious gatherings of any other faith than our own. We're showing some, some shape of ta'zim, for it, avoid it. You can go and meet the family later on. You know, if they're having just a sit, meet and greet at some other point at their house, you can go for that, but do not go to the funeral. When does the age of youth actually end in Islam? It ends at 40 years old. Politics, being involved in the country in which we live. Is protesting haram? If there's nothing else haram associated with it, then it's this hope. Is it necessarily the most uh, productive thing? Maybe, maybe not. But is it... So now there's some protests where they're going to be like music blasting, girls dancing, this and that. Like, okay, I came to bring all this up. But this, so what generally we want to do is we want to establish something where the commands, commands of Allah are being preserved where they're being upheld. Like now, you know, there's some brothers who are working hard for uh, in the Palestinian front. And they're going, they're making a point that they're going to protest. But when it's Salat time, they're going to make sure that they're going to be at a place and a time where people can make wudu, when they can pray their Salat and Jamaat. They're facilitating these things so that they are taking whatever dunyavi is about, whatever their strength or weakness is, but they're making sure that they're bringing Allah's help along the way. So, protesting, you know, this goal. It's not haram. And we're not protesting because we believe that these people can change the aqwal. We're protesting, we're doing this with a belief that this is sababu min al asbab. This is one of the means. But the more powerful means is the most. And we take whatever means are available to us. But if you're going to protest on the streets, my humble request to you is that you protest in the court of Allah for Fajr Salat and the Masjid. Make sure you're there to protest. In Allah's court because He is al Fa'al al Haqiqi, He's the one who actually does. So make sure you're protesting in His court. Should we vote for liberals or conservatives? Honestly, <laughs> our brothers in NCCM, they're doing good work to try to coordinate the Muslim vote and to coordinate a Muslim, like a strategy amongst the Muslims so that we get meaningful results. I will refer you back to them. I've attended some of their gatherings. And I feel comfortable that there are people who know what they're doing. Politics is not inherently my game. So when something's not my game, I'm not going to play. But that is their game. So, mashallah. Brother Stephen Brown, who is their CEO, he also lives in our area. So, you know, we can be in touch. We can understand from them how to strategize. 
whatever instructions they're going to give. Inshallah, there will be khairin. At least we're coming together under someone's guidance to, inshallah, bring some khair. Allah knows what He brings. So in terms of polit- politics, I refer you back to them. When it comes to deen, and the knowledge of deen, and the hayrin, you're going to come back to your imams to get your deen from them. If ever there's a war and conscription is placed, how do we avoid fighting for the non-Muslims and against our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters? A valid question, I don't have an answer. I know I'm not familiar enough with the laws here concerning conscription. So it's something we'd have to look at. The last section, which is actually the longest section, social dealings. We have about... 17 questions or 17 slides to go. I don't know if I'm going to hit it in five minutes. And social dealings. The hidden dimension of a person's Islam. Social dealings, they reflect our deen. If our social dealings are according to the commandments of Allah, then we have a sense that our deen is getting closer. And if our deen is merely restricted to our five times daily salat, and our social and financial dealings are completely an, another way, then this is fine. So, questioner asked, I have issues going on with my other sibling. He had wronged me many times and has done various things that have broken me. I give him greetings and he has, and has small talk with him every so often. Salam, how are you doing this and that? He has backbitten me a lot and said things that I will never recover from. He displays me as a terrible person to the public and acts as I am a horrible person. Am I allowed to block him out of my life? If not, how do I establish to repair my relationship with him? But set boundaries and tell him what he is doing is wrong. So, Rasul, one thing that we have to be clear about, Allah gave us our family. Now, I heard this line from Mufti Mank, I'm just going to paraphrase it and put it in my own lines. That Allah did not give you a choice who you, who you have as a brother, sister, mother, father. Allah did not give you that choice. Allah stipulated on you that you, missed, you must have, make Salat al Rahim, you must join ties with Kitchen. So there's no two ways about it. You must make joint ties with Kitchen. You don't like how they're operating. This is part of your trial. This is part of your trial. You have come to terms with it that this is a trial that Allah has put me in and I have to deal with it. So I'm going to do what I can. Can you cut them out? Can you block them? Absolutely not. Maintain small talk with them. If they're backbiting you, it hurts. It doesn't hurt so much when my enemy kicked me when I was down. It hurt me when my own blood and flesh put a knife in my back. That's what hurt me more. But it is what it is. This was not something which Allah was unaware of. You have to join Hajj kitchen with them. If they're going to talk bad about you, then you let them what you talk. But be kind, be courteous with them so long as you can. I was lately very harshly judged by a very well known and high status individual. It's not the first time that I was judged by this individual, and it genuinely pains me the way I'm judged and treated by this person on multiple occasions. He further adds, I understand that I am very sinful and a bad person that always has the tendency to make mistakes, but I am tired of being judged, and Islam preaches equality for the high status or low status, rich or poor, ugly or good looking. I want to have respect and not be judged like this. If I call this person out on it, I am scared I will be back, I will receive backlash and judged by the community. What would be a respectable and Islamically acceptable way to approach this individual who is older than me and set boundaries straight and make sure that I am not coming to be judged again? I'm not going to be judged again. Mm-hmm. You know, the person who says only God can judge me, as far as I remember, he is not a prophet. As far as I remember, he might have made a lot of shukr, but that might have been part of his name. He was not a prophet. Islamically, there is. If you are committing a sin, if you are doing something wrong, then expect to be called out. Because Rasulullah says, 
the one who is able, the one who sees a sin being committed, sees some wrong being done, let him stop with his hand. If he's unable to do that, Allah let him stop with his tongue. If he's unable to do it, then let him stop with his heart. And that is the weakest form of Iman. So, Iman demands that when I see something wrong being done, a sin being committed, I must stop it. So if someone sees something wrong, a sin being committed, and you hope that he's not going to judge you, that's not going to stop. That's not going to stop. If he some, sees something which is kind of inappropriate, and then now there's hope that, okay, why you know, the person should have good expectations of you, then he should not humiliate He should not humiliate you. But if someone's doing something wrong, then he should make it clear that he should be under hope, he should be expecting that as a believer, someone should, he's calling me out. So, being judged. Why is this person judged? So there's a lot that's going on behind in this question that I cannot. But we hope that you know, if this person is actually just calling out, he's humiliating for silly things, then get involved with some other elder who can guide, who can instruct him. Because if he's already not going to listen to you and he's all going to call you, call you out, then attach him. Bring someone who's a bit more you know, respected in the community who can speak to him. But with this, just with this information I have, I can't give you too much more than that. Can I be friends with a non-Muslim? So it depends what type of friend. If it's a close, you know, it's like a friend in passing. Now that there's scope for that. If it's a friend who you can't say no to, you know, there's some friends like that, you can't say no to them. They go, oh, man, come, I want to go to such and such place. Let's go. Like, no. Bro, man, we had each other's backs. How come you're going to leave me like that? It's like, okay, okay. Okay, man, I'll wait to if he's that level of a friend, then no, you cannot have a friend like that. You cannot hold an honest friend like that. Because he's... How do you expect he's going to respect your, your limits in the deen? But if he's just a casual friend, an acquaintance, or a bit more than an acquaintance, yeah. there's scope. But do not let it increase to the point where they can make you do whatever they want, even against your own values. How does someone make deep friendship? Like any relationship, it's nurtured. You keep on looking out for each other. You look out for them. Generally, you know, in Arabic they say, "An insan, Abdul Ihsan," that a person is the one who recognizes and who is cognizant of the good that was done to him. So, if someone is good, you're good to someone, and you're a well wisher for someone. You work to maintain a relationship. Inshallah, that will be meaningful to develop deep relation, deep friendships. Is it possible for a woman to work at a place like Winners if she needs to do so for financial reason, or should it be avoided? Look, if she absolutely needs to work at such a place, it's in scope. She should not be working at such a place where you know, she is deeply interacting and mingling with men and there's no scope of you know, seeing herself from it to that. But she's shopping the shelves or whatever. If she can find something else and something which is even more Sharia compliant where she is only within women, even better. But if not, then this is not, she's not serving haram, she's not serving, serving wine, she's not dealing in riba, so, you know, this scope. Next, if I want to leave the house to run errands, visit my parents, etc., do I have to take, I have to ask my husband? Yes. So, the men, they are the caretakers, they are the ones who maintain the women. So if they're the leaders, yes, there is. And there should be some understanding. It's not like every single time, like, my mom is, Madame, est-ce que je peux aller à la toilette? And I go to the toilet for every... There's an understanding which will be developed. But... Rather than to say she has to ask every single time, rather there should be a clear understanding of what she can do. And when she feels hesitation to doing something, when she perceives that she, the husband might have an objection to it, that is when the, she must really ask for uh, ask permission and get this get the consent of her husband. But you know, there's many times things are, are you know there's feeling that we have with each other. You know, my son will take my thing. He'll take my credit card. I don't have a problem with it. I know that I, you know, I trust him with it. Take it. It's 
fine. Normally you should be asking me, but I have confidence that he's a sensible guy. I'm going to get the notification if he does anything stupid. He's going to be, he's going to be hearing about it. <laughs> so, you know, this, this permission which is understood, that is real, and that's something which should be developed in this, in this marriage scenario, and you know, should be developed. How to please my mother, how not to be a mama's boy, and how to deal with one mother's emotional blackmail. Okay, so we have to understand what is the position of the mother. As long as she tells you, so for a son to obey his mother, to obey his parents, he must do so. So long as they are not telling him to disobey Allah. If they are asking him to commit dhulm on someone, like his wife, then they don't, he does not have to listen to them. If he is, they are asking him to you know, do something problematic, then he doesn't have to obey them. But he should seek the du'as, he should seek the pleasure of his mom. Now this person, this son, he has a responsibility to his mother, he has a responsibility to his wife, he has a responsibility to his children, he has a responsibility to his employer, he has a responsibility to many people. He has to give all of these responsibilities and his mother should be cognizant of that. If she is making him miss these responsibilities, then we have a problem here. So how not to be a mama's boy? Well, be sensible enough to judge what are the responsibilities that you have and figure out how you can give these responsibilities. How to deal with one's mother's emotional blackmailing. Once you connect yourself to the ilm and you know what Allah demands from you, then you can understand when is someone pushing you past what Allah is demanding from you and when is someone within their limits. But a point I have to stress is it come to the ulama and learn. Come to the ulama and learn. Come to the ulama and learn. One brother came to me just last week or maybe a week before that. And he was telling me that his wife went back to her parents and until her parents give her permission to go back to her husband, she's not going to her husband. Once a woman gets married, her number one obedience is to her husband. Her parents are secondary. So clearly this woman did not have the ilm of deen. Because if she had to obey someone at this point, it was her husband. It was not her parents. Especially when her parents are telling her to disobey her husband. There's no obedience to any creation concerning the disobedience of the Creator. So when we look at, once we have this ilm of deen, you will do what your mother asked from you, so long as you're not oppressing anyone. Once you have this framework, do what your mother is asking. And generally, inshallah, we hope that your mother will be reasonable. And if she isn't, then it is the job of the man to to juggle them and to guide them, to instruct them. Not just let them flow around like balloons that have just been cut off going in any direction. No matter what I do, it seems like I can't make my parents proud. What should one do? I would guess that the questioner is Asian of some sort. Where did you lose that one percent in your math exam? <laughs> the parents need to look again. In terms of what the parents need to be, they need to be connected with the Ulama to see what you know makes sense. But again, from the from the point of view of the child, what can they do? Do what Allah demands from you. Do the best what Allah demands from you. If you can do that, then. You will never make everyone happy. You will never make everyone happy. Sometimes with your demands will be unrealistic. And sometimes that 1%, you kill yourself to get that 99, and your parents are killing you. Why did you, where did you do that 1%? That's going to break you. Yeah, I know that it has broken many youth. That's why I keep telling the, my crowds that do not expect, perfect, do not expect per perfection from your children. Understand that if they come to the masjid, they're 70%. Nurture them higher. Don't smash them down. That they're 90% and you're smashing them down. 
Okay, you're going to smash them down. When they're going to be 50, then you're going to be happy. Then you're going to be rejoicing. Nurture them. Bring them up. Raise them up. That's what we got to do. What should I do if my family is not released at all and don't care much of praying or anything else? With kindness, with akhlaq, establish some, you know, some, some harakat of ta'alim in the home. And establish some witness. Deal with them kindly. Deal with them kindly. Deal with them according to the akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu And do try to read some, some ta'alim in the home. Read some ahadith. Even this hadith being read in the house, this will bring noor. This will bring noor. This will bring the presence of the angels into the home. And that has its own effect. Our yaqeen is that that will have its effect. My family is always fighting and arguing with each other. How can I improve the situation? Try to mediate. I don't have a... You know, there's, there's no hard and fast on this one. It's a very open-ended thing. Try to bring... You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about make it slah bayna nas and he highly praises it and he says that he didn't give a given alzima to the one who does it when Allah says that if you give a great reward then it's going to be great in Allah's books it's not going to be a Bugatti it's not going to be you know a Jesco or whatever it is it's going to be great according to Allah so it's not straightforward I don't have a quick answer for you but it's something that needs to be done you're going to have to see what's rubbing each other the wrong way, try to try to bring some goodness into it. How can I look properly according to the manners and the characters of our beloved Prophet Learn them. Akhlaq. Be kind, be soft. The one who brings softness, you know, he has brought a good, he has, he has gained a great good. The one who has been deprived of softness, he has been deprived of great good. Don't burn bridges. Be kind Soften people. The more a person becomes senior, the more sunnah comes into a life. The person's life, the more he is soften. So try to be soft to people. Do not turn. Do not back down from the sunnah. Do not back down, but deal with them softly. How do I stand up for oneself? How do I stand up for oneself? Well. You know, this comes back to our kind of mindset, our colonized mindset, where I consider other people's lives, and other people's lifestyle better than mine. It's not better than mine. The sunnah is the best life. The sunnah is the best way. Someone is going to try to make me look down, trying to make me look bad, because I am not compromising my, my principles. You know, when it came to my own self, I can compromise my own self. When it came to the commandments of Allah, I can offer. So this is understanding your value. Understanding our value. And what is the thing that gave us value? Our Isa, our honor, our respect, our dignity is in, in respect to Allah, to the Rasul, and deen, and to the believers. It is in deen. So when we live deen, then we should know what we're doing in the best way. With this knowledge, then we find the courage to stand up. And uh, just a little side note, our friends at Unicity Gym, from Mabili Masjid, this is our team, this is my team. And they make it a point that whenever they're working with the youth, along with teaching them, whether it be MMA, whether it be Multai, whether it be Judo, but they give them confidence, they give them confidence. And now these youth are standing up tall. They're not, they feel proud about their deen. They feel proud about this community of Muslims around them. So surround yourself with good people. Surround yourself with people who are on deen. Surround, surround yourself who, who's with people whose value is because of deen. Inshallah, this will rub off them. How not to be antisocial or deal with social anxiety. You know, if it's clinical, that's a whole different level. To be antisocial, we try to look. Rasulullah Sallallahu says that the one who mixes with the people, who deals with their annoyances and their harms, is better than the one who stays you know, secluded. So try to mix with good people. Try to mix with good people. And 
slowly as we develop some confidence. Uh, when you surround yourself with good people, then they will give you that confidence to mix. And inshallah, you know, keep on getting better. It's just like public speaking. How do you do public speaking? It's complicated. I remember the first time I had to give a talk, public speech, in front of three people. My speech was two minutes and 41 seconds. Then, later down the line, when I had to give a talk in one of the bigger gatherings, it was to about 15,000 people. I didn't break a sweat. As you put yourself through the paces, you make yourself a good people. You and this fear will, will move away from you. So, make yourself a good people. Find good people. Make, it, make an effort to surround yourself with good people. Can I attend a wedding with music? The ulama has criticized this and they have told people to stay away from it. So now, now, we come back to the question we came a couple of slides back. What was the question? How to stand up for oneself. You have to understand that your principles are valid principles. That where the disobedience of Allah is taking place, you're, you're going to avoid it. Now they're going to play this card. How come you're going to avoid us? Why are you going to stay away from the wedding? You only get married once. Why are you going to avoid us in this situation? Say, look, I want you. You are beloved to me. This is one thing, or maybe one or two or three, whatever it might be. Maybe it's a full mixed wedding and you're not going to uh, you know, accommodate that either. Sometimes it happens. People say that they, they have a full mixed wedding. They ask, can you come? Ask is it mixed or is it segregated? It's mixed. I'm sorry. I'm not be able to make it. If it's segregated, no music, I'm there. You're my boy. You know I want to be there. Nothing gives me greater joy than to be at the wedding. I'll be talking to you about marriage for how many years, man? I don't want to be at your wedding. I want to be the first guy at your wedding. But if you're going to play like this, then how am going to be there. If you want me there, this is how it's going to be. Now we stand when we have our principles, we stick to our principles, don't back down on them. So like this, I would advise someone here. Stick to them, don't shoot them down right away. No, man, what is music? Haram! <laughs> Please, this is one thing. I want to gain barakah in your wedding. You're going to gain barakah by disobeying Allah? You will gain barakah by obeying Allah. Maybe even the obedience of Allah, staying away from what he, you know, what he decides. That's how we're going to gain barakah. That's, Again, okay, negotiation. How can I bring a change in society? A very good question. You want to bring a change in society? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah People will not change the conditions of a nation until they change what is within themselves. So, your job, our job, is not to change society. Our job is to change at a grassroots level. We make how we make an effort on the people, we make an effort on the hearts of the people. How did Musa Salam change society? How did he change how did he bring the removal of Firaun? He made an effort. One on Firaun, one on Bani Israel. He was a prophet, he gave Dawit to the believers to come back to their deen. He gave Dawit to the disbeliever so that Allah removes him. When they came back to their deen, and now it was presented to this one. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought that change which no human in the world could have brought. So if we want to bring a change to society, we have to change what is within ourselves. We have to change who we rely upon. And if you're going to go to the protest, go to the protest. I'm not preventing you, but protest in the court of Allah. You want to bring a change, make an effort on your neighbors. They come to the masjid. Make an effort that the orders of Allah are coming alive. Make an effort that the deen comes alive. Allah will bring the change. You want to make the change, you cannot make that change. It was never your responsibility. Changing society was not your responsibility. Changing the hearts was our responsibility. Making an effort on the hearts of the people was our responsibility. Once we do what Allah demands, <laughs> Allah is going to do what He had to do, what He has to do. 
live Q&A. We don't have time. I'm sorry for the delay to our local brothers. It's a, it's a bit uh, past schedule. I apologize.